Um, you're trying very hard to speak in Spanish, but it's not working. I know. To be honest, be no one is scared. I'm definitely not scared. Um, so, like Shakun said, he turned into a social recluse. He was sitting in his room alone and apparently speaking in Spanish. Uh, I jumped on to the Narcos bandwagon a little later. You know, I was shooting and sometimes at the end of the day you come back home and like you want to watch a show but you're so tired that your eyes are just like closing. So, I was a little late to the party but suddenly I started feeling really awkward because I was sitting in conversations, people were like, so you know we want to make, make this movie and make it like Narcos, you know. Uh, what about this idea, we can do it like a show, like Narcos. And you know that character, like Narcos, like Narcos, like Narcos, and I'm like, oh my god, just keep quiet, everything is about Narcos. This reference is just going out of hand. I cannot be like Joey sitting in this room, not aware of anything anymore. So eventually I did watch Narcos and then I understood. It made complete sense what a global phenomenon this show really is. Yeah, absolutely. It's undoubtedly one of the most successful shows in TV history. And today to talk about it, discuss it further, of course, I'm joined by my very dear friend Alia Bhatt. But we also have the godfather of Narcos here with us, the showrunner, Eric Newman. Eric, welcome to India. I think you should sit in the middle and you should sit around you. Yeah. Hello. So, Eric, this is your second trip to this India. This is my second trip. I was here uh, December of last year for a movie called Bright, right. which we publicized here. And it was a lot of fun. So, how are you liking it? I mean, tell us, tell us how was your experience? I love it. I, I, uh, I think it's an amazing place. I, I'm sort of inspired by the diversity in the city. It's a very global city, it seems like. There are, someone told me there are 16 different languages spoken here, is that possible? Is that Probably right? more. more. Yeah, yeah. Different dialects. Yeah, amazing. different dialects. And the, and the food is spectacular. I oh yeah, you tried the food? I went, oh my yes, okay, of course, I live for it. I went to a place called Trishna, which uh -huh. I like very much. And I went to a place called Bombay Canteen, which okay. I like very much. <laughs> um, and what else did I Okay, so you're good on food. I love it, yeah, I like it very much so. And I hear you're coming in from Singapore, so yes. how was it, uh, did, how did they let you get through immigration? They're really strict about the drug laws. I, 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 seriously, and I think that, you know, we get searched a little extra, I think, because yeah. they assume that we're, we're in the business. If we were smart, we would be in that business. That's a real business. <laughs> the entertainment business is nothing compared to the drug business. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, talking about the show, Eric, you had such a long journey with the story. And uh, Netflix, especially, hasn't just changed the way we watch television, it's changed how we create and how we tell our stories. And you conceived this idea 20 years back as a feature film, and today it makes for 30 hours of one of the most riveting television, and now actually 40 hours. 40? Yeah. yeah, 40 hours of one of the most riveting television show we have. Tell us a little bit about your journey with this idea and this huge uh, journey that you had. Um, I, I first heard uh, uh, stories about the drug war in, in the mid-90s. Um, communism had sort of gone away as the enemy that it was for so long, and, and all of a sudden this thing that, that had transformed America called crack cocaine had sort of taken such a toll uh, and it was a problem that we had ignored and there weren't a lot of stories about it. There was sort of the um, typical Latin American drug lord who would show up in a, 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 you know, a, a Jack Ryan movie or some you know, maybe a episode of Miami Vice, but it, it hadn't really been examined. And so I started to develop it as a film um, and what I realized about movies versus television is that in a two-hour format, you can't really get to know a, uh, a, a character in, in a way that you could see he, him as anything but, but, but bad. And, and the reality is it's much more complex than that. And, and so the characters that we depict, first Pablo Escobar, then the, the Cali cartel, and now Felix Gallardo and the Guadalajara cartel, there's a certain uh, uh, complexity that can only be uh, uh, achieved in, in, the, in the longer form. No, I totally agree with you because that was going to be my next question. I love Pablo. Okay? Yes, like, you're supposed to. It's strange. I want him to be my friend. Uh, I, I wanted him to win. Like, it was strange. And I was sitting in my room thinking, am I crazy? Like, is this wrong? I, 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 I like the bad guy. But it was not just me. It was everyone. So, um, how much of that was put down to design? Did you... 
our goal is always to humanize these characters. You know, he is the mistake that we make is to think that any of these people are 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 purely monsters. Um, you know, they're not. Uh, uh, they're empathetic monsters. They have to be. They have to actually show that they are the product of their environment, um, the economic disparity, corruption, um, the endless appetite for cocaine that America represents. It's it's. Not as simple, though I think we'd like it to be, that it is not as simple as a monster sprang forth from their mother's womb. Right. These people were made. And uh, I think the mistake that we make in the world, mm -hmm. certainly in America, is we're always looking for the monster, and as a result, we miss the monster taking shape behind us. Right, I remember especially the last couple of episodes of season two, when he goes and lives with his father. You know, and he tells him that I want to buy a piece of land next to yours. And it's almost like you stop looking at him as Pablo and you're looking at him as a father and son. You know, and then when he dies in the next episode, you have all these complex emotions you're feeling as an audience. Because you don't want to really feel bad about a person who's killed thousands of people. But you do. I wish. So, so, uh, yeah, so I want to know is, were there ever conversations in the writer's room about, you know, Compromising on so shows morality, and you know we've we've never shied away from the awful things that he did. You know we have you know uh, Pablo Escobar blew up an airplane and killed you know 140 innocent people. Um, he he killed countless men, women, and children, and we never shied away from it. Nor did we shy away from the fact that he loved his children, and that he had in his mind, as and I think this is true of everyone, we are all heroes or victims in our own story. And if you asked him uh, whether he was a bad person, he would say absolutely not, and he would have an explanation. It would not be an excuse, but it would be certainly an explanation as to why he's not the bad guy. The Americans are the bad guys, or the Colombian government are the bad guys. And to a certain degree, he, he would be right. Yep, and Pablo's gone, and uh, hopefully, and actually I'm sure the world's a better place without him. I agree. And, no, they, uh, they, you do, I, as much as you hate to see him go, you also know that you need to see him absolutely. go. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. They, they all meet the same ending. They either die in a hail of bullets, or they end up in a jail cell for the rest of their lives. Right. And now, talking about season four, you know, we've seen the first two seasons with Pablo Escobar and Medellin Cartel, third season with Tali Cartel, and now uh, the fourth season, uh, Guadalajara Cartel? Guadalajara. Guadalajara Cartel. And uh, take us through, uh, you know, we're going, you're taking us back, into, uh, back in time, into late 70s, early 80s, and we're going to see the rise of another cartel. So tell us about this decision to take us back into time and give us a little sneak peek into season four. Well, the, the plan was always to, to take the story once we've completed the Colombian chapters, we, we plan to move the show to Mexico. Um, we had perhaps thought we would follow chronologically from 1996 onwards. You know, the, the war, the drug war in Mexico is still going on today, and it's many of the same players. But what we decided when we started doing the research is we learned it's impossible to tell the story of the drug war in Mexico without telling the story of the Guadalajara cartel and Kiki Camarena. And that period, which was 1980 to 1985, was really the beginning of it. And so to, to try and, and jump midstream into it would have done viewers a disservice. At the same time, we, we felt like this was, could be seen as a standalone, for sure. It could be the beginning of the Mexican chapter, but it's also Narcos season four. So do you think people who haven't watched Narcos yet, I don't think that many of them really exist, but those who haven't, uh, they could start with season four and then go back and move forward chronologically? Absolutely. You do not need to have watched seasons one through three to watch season four. In fact, you could start season four and then watch seasons one, two, three. Okay. So, I just want to know honestly because something that constantly gets thrown to me uh, when I'm doing interviews is, you know, do you feel fear? Do you feel, how did, were you anxious to play this character? Were you anxious to do this? My big question to you is, we as an audience get very attached to, you know, the protagonists, the locations. Um, how do you feel when you're moving from season to season? Like when you finish season two, you knew Pablo was gone. Now, what was the big challenge that you faced? How, did you feel that fear that, 
okay, people may not be as invested. Because I remember people going like, oh my God, Pablo's gone now, what's left? And then came the Cali Cartel and they were like, oh my God, it's even better, like, you know? So how do you feel when you're, when you're writing the shows and when you're going from season to season? And now it's season four, it's another big, big challenge again. It's incredibly stressful. I don't know why I did it to myself in the design where we replace characters and a setting and we take a show that people seem to like very much and, and then abandon many of the things that they like about it. So it's, it's sort of horrible. Um, but the challenge, uh, and what it allows us to do, is continue to raise the bar, culminating in, I believe, our best season, which is season four, which is coming out. Uh, this week. You think it's your best? I think so, for sure. I think that, um, and I'm and I'm sensing that people who watch it agree. So it makes me happy. I think that um, you know one of the reasons why we cast Michael Pena and Diego Luna is we had an obligation to to make a a the best, most real, authentic version of the show, and that there's you know audience demand. If you ask someone to to accept the fact that they're not going to see Wagner Mora anymore, they're not going to see Pedro Pascal anymore, you have to give them something that very quickly in the first two episodes they say, okay, it's different, but I like it, and there's enough uh, of the same that I feel like I'm, it's, it's, it's still Narcos. That's amazing. So I'm really curious to know the fact that you've lived with this show and the content for so long, you know, writing, editing, shooting, just creating. How do you feel when you watch your own show? Are you able to enjoy it like like an audience, like feel the thrills and edge of the seat kind of feeling? What, the way we feel, you know, we're biting our nails and heads off. Like, do Sometimes you feel that way? I watch the show and I mouth the dialogue around, but I don't do that actually. I, I um, you know, I've now seen it so many times, uh, it's hard to, to experience it um, with, anything but exhaustion. And you're able to be objective. Yes, I, I know it's pretty good. And, and for me, I, I, you know, the only times that I've had real success in my career, it's when I've done something that I wanted to see as opposed to something that I thought other people wanted to see. Oh. And Narcos is very much a show that if I had nothing to do with it, unless I absolutely hated the people that were involved and I couldn't bring myself to watch it, I would watch Narcos uh, religiously. Do you respond to feedback as well? I mean, when you get feedback for seasons, um, it's it's mostly been positive. But do you do you all keep a check for the kind of feedback you've gotten well, the episode? I'm sure you both know that you could get a hundred great reviews, which I'm sure you often do. It's the one bad review that actually sticks with yeah, you. Anyway. So yes, there are times you know if I agree with uh, criticism, I use it as reinforcement. Sometimes I'll I'll read something about our show that I hadn't noticed. Um, for the most part, the only thing that I've, you know, Netflix compiles a tremendous amount of data. They do not share that data with me. They don't tell me, here's what people like, here's what people don't like. I do know anecdotally that the thing that people really appreciate is authenticity. It's the reality of it. And so we aspire every, every chance we get to, to infuse that authenticity. I think it's what works in global television. That's why, you know, Sacred Games, to me, is a show that I, you know, into Mumbai is the second time in my life. I don't know that much about it, but I watch that show and it feels real. And I believe that you have, we all do, you can watch a show as you have that takes place in Colombia and Mexico and you know the difference. If we were to have shot this show in Arizona, which by the way, people do, and Netflix thankfully never suggested anything but shooting in Colombia and Mexico, but a lot of American television studios and companies would say, do it where it's cheap and where you know where it's totally safe. Although it was very safe in Mexico, um, and you might do that, but an audience will tell. They'll be able to tell. They'll know the difference. Right, and uh, you know, apart from making such an entertaining show, I think you've also been kind of making a political statement with the show. You know, with every season, you seem to be zooming out. You know, we've seen Medellin, uh, we've seen Cali, we now going to Mexico. And it's, it's a bit like The Wire. We are now seeing a bigger system at play. We are seeing this war on drugs with a different perspective. You know, it's not just Mexico anymore. Uh, so talk a little bit about that. Is that. Was that always the intent, is to broaden the lens on this universe and let the audience start seeing the real problem? Uh, for sure. I mean, I think we all, every nation on Earth struggles with, with drugs. Uh, and, it's, and the same cocaine that you find in Mumbai, you'll find 
Tokyo, New York, London, Nairobi. It doesn't matter. It's the same stuff. And we still, we all have the same struggle. And we all continue to focus on the supply of cocaine rather than the demand. And you know, the, the star of Narcos is not Pablo Escobar or Felix Garrido or Kiki Camarena or Colombia or Mexico. It's cocaine. And, and so we've been allowed to sort of, in, in making this show the way we're making it, to look at the entire sort of dark web that ties it all together. You said something very interesting. I read it in an interview. You said that Colombia doesn't have a cocaine problem. They have a capitalism problem. America has a cocaine problem. Uh, you know, that's a great insight. Did you get this insight even before you went into the writer's room? Oh yeah, for sure. And I, I you know, there's, they're, they're fond of saying in Colombia, and it's true that if the cocoa leaf grew in Virginia, it would be legal in the United States. The thing that, you know, you, you, nothing is as it's presented. You know, the, the, the problem with cocaine is not so much the cocaine, it was the billions of dollars that were leaving the U.S. economy and going down to South America. Had that not been the case, I think we'd have a very different relationship with cocaine. And uh, Eric, uh, this season, the first couple of episodes, you've also co-written, right? And uh, the IMDb page says you haven't, you know, you're coming back to the writer's chair after by being blue. blue. And what, what made you take that decision is to come and sit in the writer's chair? By the way, that is a, I don't, that's incorrect on IMDb. That is a, another Eric Newman that I have yet to encounter who wrote an MIT like PD Blue episode in 1994. I was still in college. Oh, so, yeah, is, so is, that's is, not is, it, is this the There's first time that you were? Eric Newman, who is, uh, writes religious films, and that's not me. And then there are two Eric Newmans who That's are, a note to IMDb. There are two Eric Newmans who are murderers. One most recently wow. who threw his wife off the balcony of a cruise ship. Yeah, it's strange. I guess it's a fairly common name, but no, that is not mine. I was a film producer for, for many years, and I, I found my way in the television fairly late, and uh, I, I really, if you told me all those years ago that I would end up in television, I would have thought I had failed because television in those days was not what it is now. And I think shows, and Narcos is certainly one of them, and we take no credit for this movement, but the global television space has exploded with such amazing shows. I mean, it, you know, and Netflix is carrying a lot of them, Fauda and Sacred Games and, and Babylon Berlin. And yeah. Money Heist. Money Heist is great, yeah. yeah. So that's, I think that's, to be a part of that, really for me the only way that I could have been satisfied in television and I, I love it. Right, and one thing I want to ask you as a producer is, you know, generally because you've been in both worlds, feature and now TV, you know, for future producers they're always getting anxiety about the opening weekend and all that as, as a TV producer. What, what kind of anxiety are you going through when you are about to open a show? Well, we're so connected and everything is so to the minute. We already know what people think of the show before. I mean, we've already we've gotten a few reviews. We've done press in Mexico, Singapore, here. The guys went to Europe, um, you know, Los, Los Angeles, obviously. And so we get a pretty good sense of how the show is going to go over. So there isn't a lot of anxiety beyond just wanting the, the fans of the show to watch it and feel like it continues to deliver what they've come to expect in the show. Okay, so we're going to have a little fun now. <laughs> Just, we've gotten to know a lot about the show, now we're going to get to know you a little better. Okay. So we're going to play this rapid fire game, uh, which we do a lot, which uh, I've messed up in a lot of times in my life. Um, but uh, I'm going to keep it very simple for you okay. because I'm a kind human being. Thank you. So the idea is to answer rapidly. Okay. That's what's a rapid fire. Okay, so, favorite scene or episode from Narco so far? The dance scene in season three, episode one, Pacha Vera. Okay, yeah, I love that scene. Uh, a secondary character from the show that deserves its own show. Oh, that's easy. Don Neto, Joaquin Cosio, who's the co-star of season four. He's great, right? Yeah, yeah he's yeah. the best. He's amazing. Our cast, the Mexican cast, these are the, the, some of the greatest actors I've, I've ever worked with. That's amazing. Okay, if you were to choose to choose an actor to replace Wagner Mora, who would it be? Tough one. Yeah, really hard. Um, Joaquin Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> okay, favorite Spanish expression? Uh, in Mexico they say, 
no tiene madre, which means it's it's a it's a it ha, it's motherless and it's a sort of a bad thing. If something goes wrong, Diego can explain it better than I can, but that's basically it, right? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. One show that you wish you uh, you would have made. Show that you watched. That you oh, The Sopranos. That's the great really? show ever. Okay. And a story that you feel needs to be told. I think the real story of Wild Wild Country needs to be told. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that was amazing. You did very well, Thank spoke you. very rapidly. Um, this conversation in this evening would be totally incomplete without the stellar cast of Narco Season 4. So please welcome the humongous stars Michael Pena and Diogo, Diego Luna. Welcome to India, welcome to Mumbai, Michael. Thank you you are out grabbing some Indian food. Enjoy. Some Indian food? Oh yeah, like in the morning I just I just show up, like we did it yesterday. Um, just go to breakfast and whatever they bring, I'm just going to eat it. It's all good. Yeah, too sad we don't have you guys here for too long, but you know, uh, I hope you guys enjoy this. Shakun's a very good cook. The next time you come, you should make some paratha. I, I might be a cook, but I've never made parathas. <laughs> just, just for the new. Yeah. Uh, Michael, you are playing Kiki Kamarena, and yeah. uh, you know he's had huge contribution in the in the war on drugs. Uh, when tell us about your attachment to the show. When Eric came to you with the story, had you already seen the show? Um, so I, I think Eric, me and Eric spoke about three years ago, um, and I didn't. To be honest with you, I didn't watch Narcos. Uh, like I told some of you guys, it's because, uh, you know, my, my son was six, so I watched Pixar and, you know, awesome. Toy Story like 50 times. And I watched a lot of those, almost by heart. And, um, and then after we had a great meeting, um, I, I watched two episodes, I remember that night, and I thought, wow, they captured Latin America better than most movies. Um, and then I binge watched the first season. When the second season came out, I binge watched that one, and then it's great that that's my research, and um, and then I watched season three like a month before we started filming. So you went from Ant Man to Narcos. That's quite a shift in headspace. Yeah, no, exactly. But I blame Narcos, you guys, for my binge addiction now. Now I, I I'm in the world of uh, binge watching. I need, I need, I need. <laughs> like all of us. Uh, Diego, um, tell me about your um, research because. I hear, unlike Pablo, uh, Felix kept a pretty ro low profile and was sort of held back. Uh, there's not much footage that we have of him. So, is that an advantage uh, that you know you get to kind of create your own perspective, or what? Tell us a little bit about your research. Yeah, well, it was. Um, th there's there's a period of time where he really liked to be on the newspaper, but he was he was. He, he wanted to be seen more as a businessman. So he would be in the social part of the, the, the newspaper, like in the opening of these. And he had hotels, he had restaurants. He, um, but, uh, but, it, but it was difficult to find images of, 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 of his intimate world, you know? While many of these characters uh, are very flamboyant and, and uh, uh, this, guy, this guy knew, I guess, the, the, the value of being discreet, you know, in this world. And he's also kind of like a, a well, I believe he's, he's, he's a different kind of drug dealer. He's a, he's a trafficker that is willing to, to leave everything behind and sacrifice everything, you know. He, you have this idea of the, 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 the drug dealer that is born in a little town and when he makes tons of money, he builds the biggest and most horrible house in the town and then he, he just like fixes the plaza and fixes the church and you know and and this guy no this guy left Kukacan and uh, went to Guadalajara to build uh, his empire because he saw an opportunity there and if it was somewhere else he would have gone I'm sure uh, I think spending so much time near the governor 
of, of, of Sinaloa made him a little bit like a politician, you know, the kind of guy that is willing to say whatever you want to hear uh, to get what he wants, you know, the, these people that are great liars and very charming, and charming and uh, till you realize you like, have nothing else in your pockets and they're gone. Yeah, uh, so I think it was interesting to find out that I had to read uh, a lot of, 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 of the, the news and a lot of the uh, commentaries on, of other people on him to understand who he was, you know. And, uh, Michael, what about your research? Well, um, I, I was also like reading a lot, like I read, you know, Wikipedia and everything that I could find on Google, I read the Time Magazine thing, and I wasn't really getting a, a, a real gist of what made him tick, you know, like what motivated somebody to actually um, put himself in harm's way in order for him to accomplish what he thought is justice. Um, so, I, but I did have a, a, a bit more understanding when I, when I talked to Mika uh, Camarena, and you understand, I just, I, I had just, you know. That's his wife. wife. That's his wife, right. sorry. Um, and so I, I had just done, you know, Ant-Man, which is like, you know, the guy wants to be likable, wants to love everybody, he's a lovable dude, he thinks he is. And this one, um, it was different. It was, it was a person that was just fed up with the injustices, especially when he was looking at it, and, and, and he can point it and, 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 and point out the injustices and see who's, that the, that the police were involved, the local police, the federal police, and then politicians, and then the government, and nobody was doing anything about it. Everybody was turning you know, a blind eye to it, and he got fed up with it. And then I think that's what motivated him and also him trying to persuade people that this thing is happening, and they wouldn't believe him when it was out in plain sight. And I think that's what fueled him to, to you know, bring it upon himself to make some kind of difference. Right, and uh, you guys worked together before. You directed him in a film called Cesar Chavez. That's right. Correct. So when, when you guys were working together on that film, did you guys already know you're going to work together in Narcos? Yeah, we were. Yeah, we about talked it. about it. We're like, hey, is that years. the reason? Is that is was that a casting coup then? Yeah, and you said, you know what? In eight years, we should do Narcos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Before even it came out, we were because working in the, in Sonora, in the north of Mexico, Hermosillo, uh, in Hermosillo, Sonora, and uh, and, and uh, on a way that's really close to where the, this this well where my character is from, uh, where Felix is from. And uh, we did experience Mexico, which I think it was very, I mean, we saved you a lot of uh, money and time, I guess, because uh, Michael and I were in the north of Mexico, in the fields of Mexico, where this story would have happened, you know? And recreating the 70s, which is the exact time where, you know, where, where uh, this, this whole organization starts to starts to grow, you know, and to... Yeah. And back then, he, he was telling me what to do for five months, and then, you know, in this one, he was trying to tell me what to do <laughs> for eight months <laughs> as a character. Well, uh, Diego, also, you... you <laughs> got it. No, he didn't learn that one. <laughs> uh, wait, I, I understood it. I think yeah, it's okay. Yeah. I can print it, it'll be good. Yeah. <laughs> Diego, you also grew up in Mexico in the 80s. So in some way, this story is closer to home for you. Yeah. It's more personal. It is very personal. Uh, I, it is very personal also because it, it, it's the foundation of the mess we're living today. You know, what happened there in the 80s. And the case of Kiki Camarena is, it determines a lot on, on, on the relation between the States and, Mex and Mexico. And um, uh, I remember being in the 80s as a kid, uh, I was six years old when, when, when this event happened. Uh, so I don't remember that. I guess my father was hiding this Mexico from, you know. For me, Mexico was something different. But then when the 90s came, I started having an opinion, worrying uh, uh, about the, the, the violence erupting and, uh, and understanding how crucial the 80s were and how crucial what happened here. This basically is the story of of something that got built that for a few years worked fantastically and then just fell apart and fell, fell into, into a way. And I'm talking about what's not in this season, like 
that fell into a way that today we are living horror over there. You know, it's the same. It spiraled out of control, but this is where this is where it started. And, and everything started. Hopefully, season five closer to present. Are we going to see? Are we going to come? Because this war on drugs is never going to end. It's it's just it's it's an endless I, war. I, I, I can neither confirm confirm or deny that season five. Uh, I, I think it, no. Is I, that I, a no I, comment I moment? I can confirm. I get, they they told me yesterday. I got a call. Uh, yeah, in, in a very special phone I have, and they said if it's a success in India, we will have. All right, it's, 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 it's on to us. us. Can I have That's that true. special phone, please? Yeah. Yes. I would like to receive some special calls. <laughs> I see. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we 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 can talk on November seventeenth. Right. And Diego, going a little off track. Last night when we spoke, you told me, uh, you know, you were drunk. drunk. I was drunk. No, before that, I have to ask you guys. Um, <laughs> I have to ask you guys. Um, Wagner Mora, Pedro Pascal, these are characters and, 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 you know, the people... Are you getting worried already? No, I just can't, I can't wait for this question. Because if you've been asked this question a lot, I get it a lot. Sorry, I have to ask you the, the you know, the cliché comparison question. Because uh, it's true, these are characters that we literally looked up to, okay, uh, for the past few seasons, and it is, um, it could be a bit... Uh, nerve-wracking, right? To step into these big, huge, humongous shoes. Or are you guys not thinking about it at all? Treating this as a, as a completely different, independent show season, like it didn't even happen before this. I, to be honest with you, I didn't think about it that way because it was, um, it wasn't like Pedro Pascal had enough and he's leaving Narcos, and I, you know, then they brought in little old me, you know, like I, uh, you know, it was completely different, and, you know, and he wasn't. It, it wasn't like he played Kiki Camarena first three seasons, yeah. and then I came yeah. in, and they're like, "Wait a minute, what the hell is up with this?" It's uh, so it was no pressure. I mean, there and there was enough work. We were constantly traveling and working, and had pages to memorize to be, you know, yeah. nervous about it. Too much to do to be nervous. Okay, then what about you? Uh, no, there's no pressure. I believe I just got really sick. Sorry. Uh, no, there's no pressure. I mean. I cannot think that way, otherwise uh, uh, we wouldn't be doing this job. I mean, obviously every time you see something, you're comparing that with the last thing you saw. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, absolutely, and, totally and, and, and in fact, I see, it, I, I, I see it differently. Those guys made this show so popular that it's the first time I don't have to worry for people to watch my work. <laughs> that, that worries out of the question, you know, it's like, it's gonna come out and they're gonna watch it. Like, the first feeling of like, being a theater actor is to be on your opening night and look out and see no one there. Just well, your parents. this time is not, exactly, not even my father. <laughs> so this time they're gonna be there and then I saw it, you know, like you'll be very responsible not to see it, but I saw it and I am really happy. And I, I think these guys left the bar here and we left it here and if they, uh, there is a, a fifth season, they're gonna, higher, yeah. they're gonna take it higher and higher because the team they put together is amazing. It's amazing. And I have to be very, very honest. It's very bold to say, let's start all over again because I don't think this is the fourth season. I, this is Narcos Mexico. It's a different, it's a different project. Uh, there's, new, there's new directors, it's a new place, it's a, it's a new cast. Uh, um, yeah, it's everything is different. Uh, so I think they complement each other pretty well. But I don't think you're going to be thinking about the previous seasons when you watch these. I'm sure we would. And that's amazing. That's really like inspiring. I'm going to take this answer and I'm going to use it next time anybody else asks me this question. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Thank you. Diego. Appreciate Before we leave, we have something to say. Yeah, we have something very you embarrassing. You were going to say something. All right, okay, okay. Time. And we, you, you, you remember all right, yes. Yeah. Going a little off track, there's something that I got to know about Diego last night. His uh, grandmother was born in India, right? Yeah, I, I, have, I, I have a tell, connection. Tell us about your spiritual connection to India. Oh, no, the spiritual connection is this. Let's talk about it. He, he knows parts of Gita, he knew about Sai Baba, he spoke about Guruma, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell us all about it. 
No, I don't think so. I mean, that, that, that is something I told you because I had four vodkas inside. Uh, well, we can get you four vodkas right now. I don't, I don't see how this connects to narcos. I, I, I guess I don't want this to be in the same well, article. Spirituality is what we sell here instead of cocaine. <laughs> No, it's really Don't put like, that, you get me to trouble. No, we really like that. Uh, it, it made us really happy that you have this connect to India. So it's like, you know, we're a little bit like, oh, you know us? Like, tell us about it. All the religious people are going to watch this show because you follow a spiritual leader in India. So talk about it. <laughs> okay, no, Shakur, you can't trouble him anymore. As you oh. understand, it's so personal. But, uh, Sorry. but I, can, I can just say that I find so many similarities between the, the, the Indian culture and the Mexican culture and... Yeah, you guys have I, rice, we have rice, you have beef, no, beef. <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, besides besides, besides the rice and curry, uh, there is so much in common. Uh, the contrast you, you, you live when you go out, the, the, and the richness in terms of the cultural diversity is, is amazing. And, and it feels like being home here. And I think that's why you're going to love Narcos Mexico. Love it and waiting Thank for it. Guys. And we are going to have to say something in Spanish. We have something to say in Spanish, and we're going to do We it don't know if it makes any sense because we found it on Google Translate. Yeah, so I'm going to try my level best, but I, I, I'm going to just pretend like I know Spanish. So uh, I say line number one, you say line number two. Yeah, that's right. So, nos vamos a volver locos si. Tenemos que esperar más. Can you translate that for us? You win. You win. Uh, Can I do like a yes. terrible job? I don't know what you said. <laughs> all right, all right. Let me let me try this. Let me try this. Could you help me? How would I say that? Well, can you repeat what you said? No, nos no. vamos a volver locos. Huh? <laughs> nos vamos a volver locos. You gotta look at it and then. Ah. Nos vamos a volver locos. Nos vamos a volver locos. Ooh. Tenemos que esperar más. Ah. We're gonna go crazy. Because we gotta wait a little more. Yes, we gotta wait. We're gonna crazy if we have to wait any longer. 16th of this month, uh, next, uh, Narcos, Mexico. We can't wait. Yeah, we can't wait. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being.